well, uh, it's 7.30, so I guess we should get the ball uh, rolling here. So welcome to the uh, June 2020 um, uh, San Jose Astronomical Association Imaging SIG meeting uh, tonight. Uh, Glenn Newell is going to be talking about uh, his uh, project that he started doing for an Arduino flats box. Uh, and also, he's going to go over some of his recent adventures with solar imaging. Um, so without further ado, Glenn, take it away. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can press all the buttons here. Screen two, share. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So this this uh, project uh, came together in just an afternoon, really, uh, because I had worked with the. Adreno uh, before for my rotator project with a lot of help from uh, Apollo. And so I had the um, software set up to do the Arduino stuff already. And I happened to have an Arduino Nano uh, in stock, so to speak. So uh, everything kind of just came, came together. Uh, I had previously purchased one of these inexpensive LED flat panels. Uh, that I've been using to do flats, um, but I uh, do a lot of running back and forth. The scope is out in the yard, and my computer's in the house. And uh, you know, I run run in the house and and uh, uh, take an exposure, and then run back out and adjust the the level on the LED panel, and back and forth, back and forth, and or or try to take a laptop outside and uh, see that. Um, so anyway, it was just a big, it was just a big hassle. So this is a huge, huge improvement. Um, so anyway, uh, you can get these inexpensive LED panels on Amazon and I've got a link here in the QR code there if you wanna, might help if I change the slide, huh? Interesting, how come it's not changing? I bet I have to click into it. Okay, so I was talking about this slide, which you guys weren't seeing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, the, these uh, inexpensive LED light panels, they're actually for sketching. Um, so you, uh, it's, it's uh, for tracing, you know, a piece of artwork or something is what they're designed for. But anyway, they're available in four sizes uh, and they're from 28 to $70. And I have the one that's that's 12 inches by whatever. Um, and uh, because I have a, a 12 inch RC that I, I clip this on to the, the end of. Um, and uh, they, they take 12 volts in, but they have this piece of electronics here on the left that you see uh, that, that's a dimmer. And the problem with that is it's only got like three levels, three or four levels, and it's not uh, remote control. And so we'd like this to work with our uh, astronomy software to adjust the, the levels. So that's what this project is all about. Uh, I also, uh, the panel's a little too bright for me. Uh, and so before doing this project, I, I had actually had uh, this piece of uh, sign white 20% plastic that I was using for sky flats with this, with this scope. Uh, and so I've been using that uh, between the flat panel and the, the scope to dim things down when I'm doing uh, narrow band flats. Um, so that's just from tap plastics. And uh, this was the, the inspiration for this project is uh, there's a discussion on cloudy nights and this photograph is from that thread. So that guy has one of those same panels, a big one, and he's got it mounted on the wall of his uh, roll off observatory there. And uh, he points his scope at it to do flats. And that's kind of where I wanna go. Um, I'm putting up a, 
a wall between my scope and the neighbor's uh, security light. He aims right at my telescope for some reason. And uh, <laughs> uh, the I'll be have a place to mount uh, the panel on the on the wall. I'm not sure what's going to happen with angles and all that stuff, but we'll we'll figure it out. Um, so, Bruce, you're letting the people in, right? So, I haven't had a ding yet uh, since you started, but I will. Okay, because I I keep getting it, and then I. Uh, uh, it might be because you have the focus, so. Okay. Up to you. I think it just means I just have to keep clicking back on to the PowerPoint to get the slide to change. So super super complicated electronics here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one two parts basically. You know, not whoops. Uh, the Arduino Nano and of course, or uh, this is an Uno. I said probably misspoke earlier. Uh, uh, any Arduino would work, but this happens to be the the Uno. Um, and then uh, you could use either uh, an NPN uh, switch or transistor, or I used a, a MOSFET. And I keep clicking people in here. I saw something about uh, in the thread I was reading uh, that if you have a 5 volt panel, you can use mm. a transistor. And if you have a 12 volt panel, you have to use the MOSFET. Something to that effect? Yeah, um, I have the, the 12 volt panel. Um, so it was just a matter of uh, uh, maybe that's a, a coming slide, but it's just a matter of removing the electronics that are in the, the panel and wiring the, the power cord directly to the two banks of, of LEDs. Um, but that's, that's the entire parts list there um, and the schematic. And I have to keep clicking over here and admit somebody. OK. Uh, so that circuit that we just looked at you know, is, is a pulse width modulator for dimming LEDs. But that's the same pulse width modulation you could also use to uh, make a do controller. So the Arduino has uh, you know, a number of pulse width modulator outputs on it. So if you wanted to uh, combine uh, things into one project, you could, or you could make, uh, using a similar schematic, you could make a separate uh, do, do heater control, however many channels uh, you need. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, yeah. um, Glenn, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, probably, probably to be safe uh, in case you use this kind of schematics for the uh, the dew eater, uh, due to the fact that the uh, amp in play are higher. Probably you need a, a, a heat sink. Uh, heat sink, thank you, and heat sink uh, just in case because. Yeah, I just in mine, I just have this uh, MOSFET uh, double stick tape. Uh, down to the the plastic uh, project box, so there's no no heat sink whatsoever, and it doesn't seem to get warm. Um, yeah, but the, but the LED uh, drain a very little current. Right. Yeah, I'm just saying that I didn't find the need for it with the uh, with the LEDs. Um, I think right, it was wrong. Way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is probably an eye chart, but you know the 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 Arduino sketch, they call it, the software, was actually written by um, Jared from uh, Sequence Generator Pro. And uh, the only thing I needed to do was just change one uh, line that defines which pin, which PWM pin the, the uh, LED or the MOSFET to the LED is on. Uh, as it ships, so to speak, uh, it was just modulating the onboard LED in the Arduino. Um, so I just moved it to another pin. But that was, the, that was the only change that was necessary. And what this thing does is it emulates, um, what's the name here? I've got a. Flip flat or uh, an Alna Tech. Say it again. Uh, Flatman, Flatman yeah. made, uh, made by Optech. It's Alna Tech. 
Bound man. attack was the, what I was looking for. Yeah, so it emulates their uh, API, so you can use their driver with uh, Sequence Generator Pro and this code in the Arduino, and you're and you're good to go. Um, let's see. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that. Get up here. So you plug the Arduino into your uh, Windows box, and you can use the device manager to figure out what port it, port it's on, and then you need to um, use that when you're admitting someone uh, when you're um, doing the ASCOM configuration, and also you need to know that when you're uploading the the code to the Arduino, uh, you need to know what port it's on. Yeah, so this is the link for the driver uh, for the professional version that's like $1,200 or something. Um, and you don't need to worry about, because you're using the Arduino instead of their uh, serial chip in their hardware, you don't need to worry about all this conversation about the FTDI driver. You can just ignore that and you just want the ASCOM driver. Um, okay, um, so actually let's do, let me jump out of this for a minute. So you see my camera now? Or you see, what do you see? You should see some SGP stuff here and maybe me talking as well. Okay, because I was just going to do the, if you look behind me, I can get my mouse to work right. Come on. Do you see behind my camera here? You see the panel come up and down? So there's there's your live demo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So back to the slide. So uh, you know you it. It shows up as on the bottom uh, menu that you have to pull down in Sequence Generator Pro for the additional equipment. You may not be familiar with this if you don't have a flat box or don't have a rotator or don't have an observatory, et cetera. Uh, there's a little pull down there that, that lets you access that stuff. And you just tell it you know, what serial port as I was just talking about. And then in the control panel, uh, in the other tab, it's the other tab, there's a section for the flat box that comes up, and that's that slider. I was just sliding back and forth to manually control the, the brightness, and then you click on the little settings uh, link here, and you can then you get a per filter dialog, which which deals with uh, you know what your focus points are and your uh, autofocus exposures, but there's also a, a column of flats buttons, which is what we're gonna do now. You click on that, and then there's a dialogue that says, you know, hey, for each filter, uh, for each binning, uh, you know, what is my exposure and what is the, the level of the flat box uh, light level? So, you know, using the, the um, focus tab in the control panel and doing, uh, I, I'm doing flat darks. So I want, and with an ASI 1600, you want your flats to be 0.3 seconds or longer. Uh, so I've just standardized on 0.4 seconds. So I just uh, was doing 0.4 seconds and moving between filters and then adjusting that slider in the flat box uh, control panel to arrive at a good setting. And now I've entered those uh, in this dialog here. So um, let somebody in. Uh, so now when I go and do flats, uh, it'll automatically remember those, remember those settings. 
So this is what I came up with. Uh, so far, I've only done it for one gain setting. I use two gain settings with that camera, one mainly for narrow band, uh, which is 200, and then I usually do uh, gain 75 for, for RGB. But anyway, at gain 200, I went ahead and did it for all filters, and uh, barely, uh, even with that plastic on there, almost too bright for the uh, the what I'm using for luminance and for the green and the blue filter because uh, the the range is from one to uh, to uh, I guess it must be 256 I think but so I <laughs> two for loom and uh, green and blue uh, and then you can see I needed a lot more for the narrow band especially the sulfur too and that's what again with that piece of uh, plastic uh, added in between the flat panel and the and the scope. I guess it'll be it'll need to be brighter when it's uh, on the fence instead of right on the end of the the OTA. Okay, so here's just an example of a flat uh, that I got and you can see the some dust maybe you can see some dust donuts here and you know some vignetting that it's going to correct for um, and yeah i got a good good histogram same shape on both sides and uh you know i'm shooting for uh 20k adu around there for my flats Okay, so then once you have that set up, when you select a flat event in SGP, uh, it'll fill in the exposure, the bin, and the repeat fields for you. Uh, and then when you go and actually run the sequence, it's going to adjust automatically the brightness level on the flat box for each of those filter events. There's also a couple other wizards, which I didn't use. Uh, maybe Bruce knows more about these, but there's a, there's a flats calibration wizard, um, which you, I guess you could use instead of that manual step that, that I did. But I was, I was really focused on keeping my exposure to one value to 0.4 seconds rather than having variable exposures. So I didn't think that would be the way to go. Uh, and then uh, there's a flats wizard, which does something about creating flats for your for your sequence based on the lights that you've got programmed in the whole sequence. But I I generally have you know like 20 targets in a in a seek in a sequence, so I don't think that's the I didn't need that. But anyway, um, yeah, so I didn't feel the need for those, but they're there. Okay, and then um, somebody might ask, well, what if I have an EL panel instead of an LED panel? And so it turns out that you need another piece of hardware. Uh, it's called an Arduino shield because it's shielding the Arduino from the, uh, from the uh, high frequency, uh, higher voltage that's needed by the EL panel. So I guess this thing plugs down on top of the Arduino and, uh, and then you go from there. Okay, so as I said, that was, I had all the parts on hand so that, and knew how to do the Arduino stuff. So that really was just like a, a quick afternoon project. Um, so it's nice when things go quickly like that and work the first time. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question. Uh, yeah. I, I read something about uh, one of the people in the thread on cloudy nights uh, was having some flickering and they figured out that they could do an alternate pin for the pulse width modulation for the clock speed. Higher clock speed and cause the flickering to just disappear. Not a problem anymore. Did you have any experience with that? And is there? Yeah, I, I haven't seen any flickering. And then also, I think because I'm using such a long exposure, uh, 
not long in terms of lights, but kind of long in terms of flats, right? Um, 0.4 seconds. So there's a f you know time for a few cycles of noise or whatever in there. Um, I so I haven't I haven't noticed any problems. I have other problems with my flats that don't have to do with it has to do with filter wheel, but that's a different whole different story. Um, or actually, maybe it's I'm starting to worry now. It's uh, uh, that the camera sensor is moving, but anyway, it's all nothing to do with this this project. Um, yeah, so I didn't I didn't see any flickering, but you get you get I got flickering originally. You know, I had not modified the the LED panel. So it still had its own electronics in there, and then I had added an outboard uh, uh, LED dimmer with a knob on it, and so the combination of those two things, you know, sort of pulse width modulating the pulse width modulation would cause some flicker when you had it turned all the way down. But uh, once I got rid of the electronics on board, then the, then the PWM was was fine from the Arduino and from the knob thing. Okay. And sorry, and I yep. think uh, that uh, the problem of flickering depends also on on the kind of uh, flat panel that you are using. Because uh, I think that there are flat panel that uh, uh, let's say multiplex between different line of the different group of uh, of LED, and that can create a, a, okay. another kind of flickering. It depends. Uh, the, the 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 model that you use are good because uh, you can arrive to two wire that are the direct wire to the LED that they are using. Yeah. So let me go back to all the all the the electronics that in between that try to help you to is too clever to to work. Yeah, so this this was pretty simple. There's just two rows of LEDs, and it, it had, you know, power connectors to the top row and power connectors to the bottom row, and then yeah. the the external power came in, 12 volt came in here. Um, so it was easy to just cut that whole thing out and What's wire that? it. What's that? Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Suggestions? Don't forget to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Okay. Uh, did you want me to just dive into the next topic, Bruce, or or? Uh... Sure. If, uh, if we have no more questions. Okay. Get rid of this guy. So the next topic, this, uh, this project uh, came together pretty good for me this weekend uh, after sort of years of trying different things intermittently with uh, solar astrophotography. So um we're going to talk about some of the solar rigs that i've messed with and things that i've tried uh then we'll go into this latest rig and what the optical parameters are you know then i did some 3d printed parts and what the first light results look like and then we'll talk about uh you know what are the next steps to take it to the next level uh, so there's filter tuning and uh, solar scintillation we'll talk about and solar guiding. And then um, I've got one slide on solar seeing, what makes for good seeing in the case of solar because it's completely different, a whole different layer of, of air at a different altitude uh, makes a difference than what we're used to at nighttime for, for stars. Um, so there's that, and then we'll do Q&A again. So let's dive in. So this is kind of a what not to do in PowerPoint slide thing, but uh, too, too much too much going on here. But but basically, uh, this is sort of a montage of of earlier things I had done trying to do solar. Um, so the first one is 
you know, I tried to catch the the ISS going across the sun, and uh, I was somewhat successful on my second attempt. Uh, the first was complicated by a by a margarita, and that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole nother story. Um, but uh, uh, something you you don't want to do when you're photographing an eclipse or uh, something like this ISS transit of the sun that. It takes a lot of focus and only lasts for a couple seconds. You don't want to have any uh, impairment going on there. You want to be at the top of your game. Um, but so that was just a white light filter on a, I had a six inch RC at that point uh, for this particular. And you can see here in the, uh, this is a, a sunspot through that white light filter. And here's the, the ISS going across. And you can see a couple sunspots Wish we had sunspots like that now, but we're in the solar minimum, so we'll deal. Um, so, so that's you know white light filter. That's one thing. And then um, at one point, I picked up a, a Coronado PST, and so this is a you know all in one. Uh, it's the least expensive H alpha solar scope you can get. Uh, I didn't realize before I bought it that. Um, it's not really suitable by itself for any kind of photography because where the focal plane is, it, this thing has a built-in uh, diagonal. You know, most of us are used to removing diagonals from scopes to, to mount our cameras uh, at the focal plane, but this thing has the, the diagonal uh, built in, so you can't do that. So it turns out that you have to use a Barlow to move the focal plane back out of the, the eyepiece holder and in, into your camera. And uh, you can't just slap a Barlow in there and have it work. You actually had to go buy you know, this particular Barlow and take it apart and modify it. And you know, so it turned out to be quite the, quite the project. But I did end up using it uh, when we did the coverage of the, the eclipse uh, at Hoagie Park. Uh, we, I projected that. That's what this picture down here is, all these people looking into this tent. Uh, I had uh, two projectors and one on a NASA feed and one showing the, the feed from this camera on the uh, Coronado. So uh, I do have a double stack for that as well, but what I've found is I haven't learned how to tune it, and it, and it seems like you you know, you're you're trying to focus, and you're trying to tune uh, the filter that's at this end, and then you're trying to tune the double stack, and it just never seemed to really come together for me. So that was somewhat frustrating. And the other thing I found with with solar is you're out in the hot sun, and it's kind of uh, unpleasant. <laughs> uh, so I would prefer to sit in my office and and control things, and you know, out at the observatory. Uh, so be nice and cool. So I want to do things remotely such as focus and, and other adjustments. Um, I did, uh, it's been a few years now, but help out with the solar program. I got them uh, a Malincam camera for one of their Lunt H alpha scopes and also a uh, uh, LCD monitor that's bright enough to be seen at least inside a, a, a pop-up uh, outside during the day, and so they've been using that to show views through the H alpha scope uh, at the solar Sundays. So I did that, and that involved uh, using a focal reducer to get that all to work right. And um, then uh, it's been about a year now. I I saw a used uh, camera quark on uh, I think it was from OPT. Uh, so I picked that up, and so that's a H alpha filter, and it's designed to use a Canon lens, and then you put a, a DSLR or, or an astro camera on the other end of it. Um, and so I had messed with that with uh, I had a, a Sigma uh, 400 millimeter lens, and um, I'd also tried last time we went to uh, Pinnacles. Uh, I had a uh, this 500 millimeter mirror lens. It's like a little baby SCT, uh, and both of those were very difficult to to focus. And I even, you know, I 
for for my camera lenses, I had made uh, a, a follow focus rig with 3D printed parts and whatnot, and a, and a stepper motor here to turn the barrel of camera lenses and focus. Uh, but it 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 just proved too too uh, hair triggered. I guess the the critical focus zone was was too small for this uh, kind of crude approach. So I didn't have a lot of great success with that uh, until this last weekend when I finally was able to bring a, a moonlight uh, focuser to bear. Um, so this is the latest rig that, that I put together uh, this last weekend. So um, I have a, a William Optics uh, MegRes 80 millimeter scope that I picked up at the last swap meet. And um, this is right at the limit for where you need a uh, energy rejection filter uh, so that you don't get your scope and your uh, camera cork, which is down here, get everything too hot. So I had previously bought a uh, 90 millimeter yellow filter for that 500 millimeter uh, mirror lens. Uh, and so now I needed to apply that to the, this uh, scope uh, but I didn't have any threads on the dew shield, so I 3D printed a little part that is a cap that goes on the dew shield and it's threaded for the for the filter. So that worked out. And then, as I said, this is a, a 80 millimeter uh, William Optics uh, ED triplet. And then uh, I threw this solar finder on here. So far, I haven't really used that, but it's it's there. And uh, the camera quark has a built-in bar low, so you know focal reducers are going to push your focal plane in towards the scope, and bar lows are going to push your focal plane out away from the scope. So in this case, I had to add uh, a bunch of spacing here between the OTA and the focuser um, to get things to come to focus. So I had figured out how much I needed and ordered some metal parts, but they're back ordered, of course, because of the whole COVID thing. So I did go ahead and then I, I had uh, two pieces, but I needed another 100 millimeters. So I 3D printed a 100 millimeter spacer for that and uh, picked up a used moonlight focuser and then some bits and pieces of, because this thing was designed for a camera lens, you have to go from the focuser to a, lens bayonet and then the camera quark and then uh, back the other way to uh, T2 for the, the camera. Um, so that all came together this weekend. And uh, I think we've got, we'll have some results in a minute. Okay, so again, this is an 80 millimeter scope. Uh, it was F7 but with the 4.2 telecentric Barlow, you're almost at F30, which is really where you wanna be for doing solar or planetary. Uh, so that's a, a focal length of, of uh, almost 2,400 millimeters. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty, for, for planetary and solar, the rule of thumb of, of around one arc second per pixel doesn't apply, you actually want, you know, four, five, six, seven X that uh, resolution because of the, the lucky imaging approach versus normal stacking. Um, so anyway, this is the the uh, specs after putting the the Barlow on that on that scope, right? And so, as I said, there's a there's a rule of thumb for planetary and solar which is your focal ratio should should be three to seven X a pixel size. Uh, and to put that a little more succinctly, you want like five X if you've got good scene or seven X for superb scene. Um, so seven X with the, the ASI 1600 would have been F 26.6. So I'm a little over that. Um, but it's it's working well. And then uh, the plan is to try to pick the best uh, scene using a, a solar scintillation monitor, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. 
uh, so that I'm only taking pictures during the absolute uh, best seeing conditions automatically. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do drizzle processing to take advantage of that uh, oversampling. And then the, the camera that I threw on there this weekend is not really the optimum camera for planetary. Uh, so I do have a couple uh, ASI 174s and uh, that's got bigger pixels and it's the camera in the ZWO line that has the fastest frame rate. So that's the other spec that you want for planetary and solar is to have a really high frame rate, again, because of the lucky imaging approach. Okay. So just uh, the 3D printed parts, no, no big deal. I, uh, Paulo and I, and, and now Bruce, are 3D printing stuff, and we've been experimenting with this ASA plastic material uh, for outside, and it's got a good UV resistance, and it's less stinky when you're printing it, less toxic fumes. Uh, it's easier to work with than, than ABS. And the other material I had been using was carbon fiber uh, and nylon, and this has got a, a smoother uh, finish. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then to make, you know, this, the, the moonlight focuser and the camera and the camera quark weigh quite a bit. Uh, and so I didn't want to hang all that weight off of these threads and, and not have it uh, supported. So if we go back, um, kind of hard to see here, but I put a scope ring on, you know, there's, the two scope rigs on the OTA, and then I put a third scope ring on the other side of that adapter, uh, and I had enough room on the dovetail plate here to, to fit all three of those uh, scope rings on there. So that makes sure that I'm not dependent on that 3D printed part to hold everything up. Okay, so first light results. So here's a, a, a crop of, uh, a sunspot that was just kind of going around the edge of the sun. So we're sort of looking at it kind of edge on a little bit. Um, so the specs on the data acquisition here, uh, so I grabbed about 2,500 frames. Uh, this is the uh, region of interest that I used, right? So you, you can go faster if you look at fewer pixels coming off the, the camera. So this was an ASI 1600, which, so this is about a third of the frame of that sensor. And I was able to get uh, down to 45 frames per second. And I noticed that when I went to smaller areas that I didn't get really any more frames per second. So there wasn't much point in going smaller. But anyway, when I stacked it, I took the best 10% uh, of those 2,500 and uh, I stacked it with auto stack art and I use Registax just for the wavelets part sharpening. And then I used Photoshop and some Topaz, et cetera, to, to finish it off. So that, that um, this is, for me, this was pretty exciting uh, results compared to what I had been able to achieve earlier. So I'm looking forward to more sunspots and also finding some, some prominences. Uh, so, but there's still a number of things that could be improved. Uh, if we looked at the full uh, frame, uh, you know, we, I've got these, what are called Newton's rings. It looks like kind of like a Fresnel lens. Uh, and this is caused by that super bright solar energy uh, bouncing back and forth between the the two edges of the sensor glass uh, in front of the camera, and they're co constructively and destructively uh, adding, and they create this this pattern. Um, and so, it's a well known uh, issue with solar astrophotography, and there's. Uh, a number of different things you can do. And basically it all comes down to making the light come in at an angle through that glass instead of straight on. 
And so they have ways to tilt your camera a little bit. Uh, and so, you know, I have one of these ZWO tilters, but I don't really have any uh, space for any, you know, for any more devices. Uh, there's really no adapters between the focuser and the that I can get rid of or that I could add to between the focuser and the the uh, camera uh, to make room for for this device and it's also um, it lets light in around the edge so you have to tape it up and it's just kind of it's just kind of a crude uh, approach um, this link here for this QR code in this URL here is for a, a site where a guy goes through all of this and also uh, di discusses using flats as a method of, of removing this. And uh, he also talked about, you know, Daystar, the people that made the camera quark, have a, a more mechanically slick uh, solution but it's uh, it's more expensive and it also it takes up even more back focus uh, so I didn't want to do that so I am going to try this prism approach somewhere in my pile of astro stuff I already have a two degree um, wedge prism for another project um, which has to do with using focus lock software like you would use on an on egg in an off axis guider. Uh, but I haven't, you know, it's one of the 999 projects that I haven't completed, started but haven't completed. But anyway, I have that around somewhere. And then I went ahead and ordered uh, this four degree tilt one, because uh, that's what this guy on this website was using. And it also has an anti reflective coating. Uh, they have three different models, one of which has the anti-reflective coating in the HA uh, range. So that's the one that, that I ordered. And it's an inch around, so it's big enough to cover the, uh, the sensors, uh, both in the ASI 1600 or the ASI 174 for sure. And I should be able to squeeze that inside the, uh, the lens adapters that are already there. So hopefully that'll solve that, that problem. And then I'm going to click back in here. Uh, some of the other things, the camera quark has a tunable filter. And I'm avoiding saying the Edelon or however, because I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Bruce always corrects me, I think. Uh, the HA filter is, is tunable. And so I, that's not going to be remote controllable. And but one of the frustrating things about it is it's like a little oven. Uh, so you you turn it a click, and then you have to wait five to ten minutes for the LED to change color again, telling you that it's reached the new temperature. And and so it's um, I have to get used to dealing with that. Uh, run outside and change it, and wait ten minutes and see if it's the contrast has improved or, or what the deal is. So there's dealing with that. Um, and then learning how to how to switch between, this thing is designed, th this, these camera quarks come in two models. They come in a chrominance, chromience model, which is for the surface of the sun, and then a prominence model, which is optimized for the, the prominences. But uh, with the chrominance one, you can sort of fake it and go either way. So that's one reason uh, for that. Uh, but th besides changing the, the filter settings, you know, it's going to require different exposures to get the prominences versus the, the surface of the sun. So that's going to get, I have to practice it at doing that. And then uh, I do have a couple other pieces of gear. Um, I have a solar scintillation monitor. So what this does, there's a little sensor here that you mount on your scope, on your solar scope, and it's going to keep track of the scene in real time. And then there's a, a plug-in, software plug-in for the data acquisition software for fire capture that you can, you know, arm that thing. And it's like, okay, when the, when the scene goes below a certain amount, uh, you know, that's when you go and take your thousand frames or two thousand frames or whatever it is, right? So you're just going to track the sun uh, all afternoon 
and uh, this thing is just going to take exposures only when the scene is is really good. Um, so that's something to to set up, and then. Uh, since we're going to be, you know, running this all morning or all afternoon, uh, you know, do you need some kind of guiding? Uh, so normally for lucky imaging, you know, if you're on target, you don't need to to, to guide because you're going to be, you know, taking frames at, at a fraction of a second. But uh, if you're if you're zoomed in on a sunspot or or maybe a prominence. And you want to track that over, you know, the whole afternoon as a fraction of the disk of the sun. Then, um, then you might want to have some guiding. Uh, and so I do have this uh, that belongs to the club that was donated a uh, solar guiding rig. Um, so we'll be experimenting with that as well. Okay. Click, click. Uh, so. I did want to make some comments about uh, solar scene because it is really different. You know, the the scene that you would have to deal with if you were doing planetary of Jupiter, you know, would be like the jet stream. So it's way high up in, in the atmosphere. And uh, you'd probably be better off if you were in uh, Central California, uh, uh, not Central California, Central Central Mexico, or somewhere far away from the from the jet stream, uh, because that's where the turbulence in the air messes up the scene uh, for planetary and for stars that we're used to looking at at night. Uh, so again, you know, at night for stars, you want a, an observatory class location which has laminar flow off the ocean, up a big mountain, and all this stuff. Uh, and so you're optimizing for that. But solar is completely different. It's actually uh, the first 10 meters or so of air that makes all the difference for, for solar astrophotography. So it's all about sort of choosing your location to have that 10 meters of air be calm and, and uh, not disturbed. So they say avoid concrete. Uh, you want to be on grass if you can. Uh, water surrounded locations would be good. Um, higher is better. This is one case where you want to set up on your balcony maybe uh, versus being concerned about the, you know, the movement of the balcony at night with stars and stuff. Uh, so to get on the second story, looking out over a lawn would be kind of an optimal situation versus being down on the ground on a driveway or something. Um, so those are some some tips and there's uh, uh, this talks about the 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 scintillation and and the uh, there's a quote here. This is the exact opposite situation when considering stellar object. Uh, for those scintillation is rather due to higher atmospheric layers at the jet stream level, as I, as I was mentioning. So, and uh, this data. All of this data on this slide came from the, the Airy Lab uh, Solar Scintillation Monitor Manual. Okay. Q&A, don't forget to unmute your mics if you want to ask a question. And I'll go back to the... Glenn, I, yeah. I want to ask you one thing about the the previous uh, uh, slide that you have the one on note uh, uh the, 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 the let's say the last one just before the q a oh slide. sorry okay yeah because uh, on the left uh, there is a note the seeing also very deeply during the day uh, except on specific locations that i'm uh, the best thing is usually during the morning and the second part of the afternoon. So when yeah. uh, the sun is low. Yeah, that's so also counter, sort of counterintuitive. Counter yeah. Right. Right. Can you comment yeah. on that? Well, I just I just took it for for granted and I plan on ah. uh, you know, I think that I have to think about where uh, east and west is versus my lawn and stuff, but I think uh, to to look out over the grass, I think it's actually going to be mid midday, but we'll see. 
Um, but I think that the plan would be, you know, if the if I can guide on a you know on a sunspot essentially, uh, and um, just have it run all day and let the scintillation monitor trigger fire capture. Uh, then you know when it whenever the scene is good, that's when that's when I'll be taking video, so I won't have to worry about it. But it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. No, because I, I understand that the morning or the afternoon, in terms of thermic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, turbulence uh, of the air, because those are the the moment during the day where the sun the the sun heat is less, uh, let's say, prominent. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, you are crossing a lot of air, especially in the in the afternoon, uh, and that can be above other hot spot that uh, has been created during the day. So I don't know. Yeah, I understand. I understand more the the morning. In the morning, you have uh, all the you are very close to the the coldest moment in the day that is in the. Early yeah, hour I, just before. If I may. Go ahead, Paul. Yes. Uh, what uh, what Glenn has been uh, alluding to all through this is the fact that the scene for solar observation is affected by the air that isn't essentially, if you want to call it, the first ten meters or so. Mm -hmm. When the sun rises in the morning, as you can see this very clearly out in the desert you can see uh, great detail in perhaps maybe uh, first half hour or so, or so after the sun rises, you can look 50 to 100 miles across and see the mountains uh, very clearly. As soon as the sun gets up a little bit higher than its incident on the ground that you're standing on or wherever you are, will start to uh, heat up and start creating the heat current that will rise up all around you. Those are those are the ones that really mess up the scene for solar. This is not an issue at night because it's colder. Now for the afternoon, for the uh, latter part of the afternoon, after the sun's been up, it's heated the ground. Noontime, it's really heating the ground. So it's really boiling, um, so to speak. When it gets to the latter part of the afternoon and the incident of the sun on the landscape is lower, the air at this point, which has been heated up all day, is starting to cool off. And so is the ground that you're standing on. When they achieve about the same amount of temperature, then the scene will steady out quite a bit. So um, you can see this effect. Um, if you if you've ever tried to do visual observation of the sun, it's pretty a pretty interesting thing that as the sun gets slower, the temperatures equalize between the air, and you start to set up an inversion, and it stills the various um, air currents, so that you will get a sharp sun. That being said, um, the effect of more atmosphere that you're seeing through, uh, which uh, Theoretically, would would reduce the light. It doesn't really pertain to the sun so much because you got too much light to deal with. So yeah. that's kind of the deal. It's an interesting balance between uh, temperature inversions and the temperature of the ground and temperature of this and the temperature of that. And oh, the other thing you should do is be able to shield your telescope from wind, also, especially when you're working with such ridiculously long. Focal length as an important part of the scene equation. Yeah, and I wondered. I, I wondered if I should, uh, you know, because my my scope is on a. Uh, it's not concrete, but ceramic or whatever. It's bricks, um, pad. Uh, you know, should I like hose that down? Um, well, I would consider getting some astral turf carpet and putting it around. Yeah. It. Okay. And uh, if you yeah. can, uh, if you can pick it up a little bit off of your, you space it off your tile a little bit, then that would create a uh, barrier to to help prevent 
uh, the tile from heating up because it's going to become a heat sink and it's going to radiate heat uh, longer. You, you want it to be able to cool down more rapidly. So a little like an AstroTurf thing just up above the ground a little bit may, mm. may really um, help that situation. Of course, you're in a difficult position anyway with your with where you are. So hats off to you if you, you make that work for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Bruce, do you want to invite people to share images or? Sure. Please. Uh, anybody that's uh, been out there in these clear nights we've been having lately on New Moon, uh, if you have some images you want to share, please. Please uh, step up. Well, I have some. Okay, PJ. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm supposed to, supposed to present now. Is that the deal? Yes. So I hit the present button, and then you see my screen. Is that right? All right. We'll try it. My entire screen. Why not? Okay. Oh. Okay. So I got set up over here. As, as uh, you may know, um, I We're not seeing your screen yet. Oh, let's see. Am I supposed to hit something? Share. Well, I don't know. Share your whole screen. Choose all. Uh, share that. Okay. Okay. You see my, oh, you're presenting your screen. Yes. Okay. So. This is um, a pretty deep uh, shot at um, what's known as the Hercules cluster. And um, Hercules, it's a big um, galaxy group, about 500 million light years away, something like that. And this was taken with uh, some very good uh, scene, better than uh, uh, it was sub arc se second that night, and this was taken with my uh, six inch telescope, which I first built in about 1982. And uh, now it's mounted on the uh, MX Plus and using the QHY 168C. So it's a color, color camera. And um, it's just, just amazing how many of the uh, galaxies you can see far away. You'll notice that they're they're rather yellow because most of them are uh, ellipticals, so they have uh, the older stars in there predominantly. There's not much in the way of spirals, so there's not much blue color in them. So that's one picture I took. Uh, it was just I had one good night of data. And then that's, uh, I added another night of data, but it just wasn't as good. So I 86 that. And so this was it that, that I have to show for that. So would so, they also be yellow because they're far away and therefore red shifted or? Uh, the, the red shift really doesn't pertain because you're only talking about 2%. Okay. So that's, that's hardly perceptible to our human eyes. However, the interstellar dust definitely would make it more red. So uh, that's that's an interesting point that you can make on that. Yeah, let's see. So this is uh, my, uh, I decided to, because I had such great scene, I decided to shoot all the prominent gobbler. So I did this, this is M3, and this is at one to one pixel ratio. And as you can see, it's modeled all the way to the core with the six inch, which is working at uh, about uh, F5.75 on a six inch. And as you can see, there's these blue stars that are in there. And from what I can, can read about, it seems that these blue stars, because 
they don't fit on the sequence for globular are those stars that have um, collided and coalesced into one another, thus restarting the clock to their stellar evolution. So that's why they're blue. Most of the stars are generally more to the yellow thing, which is brings up my next point is what color is a globular cluster? Uh, because these are very old stars. They're as old as they can be. I mean, what color should they be and how should we present them to make give a realistic presentation? Here's This is M5. And so again, you have a number of blue stars, typically about 3% of stars in a globular have, are coalesced stars. They've collided and, and stuck together like raindrops. And so that's about the ratio you see there. So here is, again, the uh, one to one ratio. Now, the interesting thing that I'm able to do between PixInsight and uh, Star Tools is that I drizzled these, these uh, images at uh, uh, 2x. But 2x drizzle is a bit too much for the data. And so in Star Tools, I can halfway undrizzle it, so to speak. So this is not the native pixel size of the original image. This is actually uh, the square root of uh, the inverse of the square root of two over one to one size. So I haven't found that feature in PixInsight, but I thought it was interesting. It gives me more ability to adjust the, uh, the pixel scale. And this is, of course, uh, M13. And again, it seems like I can't figure out what color <laughs> to, uh, oh, you little bugger. Yes, oh, there we go. OK, so of course, this is our big one. I can't see the propeller. I don't know if anybody else can. Uh, visually, how many people have seen the propeller in M13? Anybody seen it? Anybody? Visually, no. <laughs> I've seen it in images. Oh, yes, yes. I can see it in my 18-inch uh, occasionally, and of course the 36-inch uh, refractor at Lick Observatory shows it very nicely. <laughs> Uh, but it's a very subtle visual feature, but it's kind of kind of neat to see. So um, then we have one more. This is M92, which of course has the um, the uh, oh here no, I'm supposed to be hitting this one. Here we go. This is considered to be one of the tightest globulars in the list where the stars are very close together. And uh, it's interesting that you see a lot more of the blue stars, which might be what you might expect in a globular that, where the stars are a lot closer together than in other globulars. So that's sort of my inference from that, for whatever it's worth, worth every penny of that. But that's a very nice, uh, situation you look at gobblers at this time of year they're all overhead great scene the early part of june is often when some of the best scene happens in the sierras uh believe it or not so this is my shot of m101 and uh it's kind of a progress shot. I'm not through with this yet. So um, that's what I did on this one as a little exercise. Hopefully one of these days I'll get a good color camera that will work with the Vaza without uh, halo issues that I find very objectionable. So anyway, there are my four pictures or five or six. I hope you like them. And um, 
that's what I have to show everybody. Any questions? Mari M, unmic your mic. Very nice, PJ. Yes. Okay. I um, have a, I have one to a sort of work in progress uh, to to show. Can I? Hear this. There we go. Okay. Uh, by it. Entire screen, uh, screen one, share. Can you see mine? Yeah. Cat's eye. Okay, cat's eye. That's a, a work in progress uh, because uh, still uh, I have still to work on uh, the pixing side. But that is uh, uh, probably my longest uh, exposure in terms of total time because this one is uh, 327 uh, five minute exposure of uh, H alpha, a 271.03 during a few months. Uh, from my white zone and uh, that uh, was, uh, let's say, used as a test bed because I was uh, trying Nina. And by the way, the, the last, uh, let's say, 50 or so exposure has been made again with SGP because Nina is fine, but is not, uh, let's say, completely fine in terms of uh, scheduler. You, I found a problem, not problem, a limitation because uh, Nina doesn't have, at least in this version, they are promising that for the next uh, one, a, a, a decent uh, uh, schedule. So you cannot do uh, more than one job uh, for the night or uh, let's say delay at start and these kind of things. And that is a, a problem for me because uh, in my backyard I have a sort of keyhole to the sky. Uh, lucky enough I see the, the Polaris but uh, a very little uh, uh, quadrant of, of uh, east and northeast. So the only way to do uh, all night uh, images is to uh, let's say uh, uh, queue more job and work for one hour or two hour visibility and after that change subject and uh, another, another hour or two of visibility so little planning and that's a limit that i cannot uh, uh, let's say uh, accept from from Nina. Beside that, is fine. The image is still uh, is still rough, uh, not uh, not com completely um, denoised. But uh, uh, the only good things is that you can start to see the the nucleus uh, structure with the two jets that are generated probably from a binary system at the center. Unfortunately, the five minute exposure uh, saturated uh, more the center. And I have these two, the diffraction that the, actually four diffraction spike. And that's, uh, let's say, deturpate the image, but uh, that's it. Mm. That's all the because of the I think that that the original let's say image before any announcement uh, in the center that I did with uh, HDR multi scale transform in pixel inside. Okay, thank you. If you have any question, of course. I think uh, Francesca, oh, I'm sorry. Paolo, uh, any other images? No, because this one uh, took uh, 
more than three months to make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got more than uh, uh, close to 700 five minute exposure and I threw away 30 uh, percent and uh, I, I mean I was not targeting uh, this particular image I was more testing uh, the the Nina environment all the other all the other things so I I, I choose this one because it's a circumpolar target that visible from my uh, my side and uh, uh, is good for the uh, 18 HRC because in the meantime I was also experimenting and having a first light with the OAG so I have to learn also how to OA, uh, using the, the that off axis guiding so uh, that was a, a it's a, a useful target for for all this uh, testing. I have to test the OAG. I have to test Nina. This and the other. I had problem with uh, with the driving, uh, the guiding, and uh, so. Uh, but at the end, I found myself with seven hundred exposure, uh, and uh, okay, I started to throw away the. The worst part. Uh, remember that I'm in a white zone, so it's very easy. And uh, and what I get, uh, I was not not prepared to see the the the, the nucleus or the structure of the nucleus, and that's instead I was surprised. How, how many are you using the batch pre-processing script? One of them. Uh, yes, I I use it the. Um, the weight at the yeah. How many how, how many uh, subs did you, did you put in there at one time? Because I, I just hit a out of memory bug uh, yesterday. I put uh, the the entire so six hundred frame. Wow. Okay. So I don't know what happened to me because I was down around two hundred sixty or something. Hmm. And was uh, you you were getting errors or was simply yeah I got a little. Forever? little dialogue that popped up and said out of memory and ah. click OK and you click OK and it goes away. So, was that a Windows dialogue or was it a PixInsight dialogue? Can you tell? Uh, I don't think it was Windows. But, but you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working with uh, 128 gigabyte of memory, so. Hmm. Well, I had actually, actually only, <laughs> actually only, only sixty-four because I dedicated sixty-four to a RAM drive, RAM disk, okay. a RAM disk, the RAM disk, and the other sixty-four for uh, working. So that's okay. it. Um. Rob, care to comment on that out of memory issue? Got to unmute. Yeah, I was clicking the wrong thing. I, I, I think there is a problem. Uh, you know, as you know, Juan uses uh, Linux. And I think Mac OS X and, and Windows are both a little bit uh, black sheep in his mind. Uh, so when he encounters a problem like this, I think his first reaction is, oh, well, it doesn't happen on Linux. but. Uh, I think there is a, a problem with the automatic calculation and image Im image integration for how much memory to use. And if I am not mistaken, I think he did say that, but this next release of PixInsight has been held up for quite a while. So I'm hoping that if that's what it is, that it, it's going to be fixed. But Well, I noticed there were a bunch of updates uh, today, so um, maybe I just need well, to try it again. Like to the but, scripts and things. Well, this the the scripts have updated, I think, twice in the last week, and this I think was more of the core stuff. There were four updates today, I think, that were. I see. I didn't. Core I didn't related. check today, but yeah, uh, something well, about the fit file manager. Also. Yeah. Fitz file manager and something else. But I didn't know what that. Mm. Never use the Fitz file manager. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, 
I mean, I, it, it seemed to me that there was something flaky, though, in the in the uh, you know in image integration itself. There's a little box where it you can set sort of how much memory it uses, and it's set to auto. And I I think there's a bug in how it computes how much memory to use, hmm. and it tries to use too much, and you end up starting to page, and then things kind of go off the rails. Okay, I'll look for that. Is there any uh, movement in Starnet++ Plus Plus, uh, installation on Mac OS? Uh, you know, somebody asked, right, and, and in the forum, and Juan just said, look, I'm really sorry. But I, I think actually what he's doing is adding Vulkan support to the next release of PixInsight, meaning to run on GPU. And it's probably a pretty big task. So uh, he mentioned that once, but he's never said explicitly it's going to come in, in Dash 6. But I, I think that's what's happening. So unfortunately, we got held up. But uh, Francesco's trick does work to remove the signature from the PixInsight bundle. And uh, somebody, somebody else actually posted it today in the forum. So I guess the secret is out. Oh, um, OK. <laughs> yeah. But at least it wasn't uh, me. Yeah, right. I mean, I actually replied to that guy, just said, well, we didn't really want to talk about it because, you know, one seemed to think that it was really important to set this hardened binary thing, you know, on Mac OS X, which to me is a little silly. But um, so, you know, undoing that, you know, I, I figured it would raise his ire, but we'll see <laughs> if he slams his gun. Yeah. I can send instructions, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I have it going by disabling SIP, which I know is not advisable, but yeah. uh, I, I was able to get it installed and working. And, yeah, you know. basically, with the with this trick, uh, you give up the signature on PixInsight, but you keep a signature on everything else. So it's it's more secure. I'm interested. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you uh, it's just the one command that you need to to issue from the com from uh, the terminal, so it's easy. Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> Um, Francesco, you had some images you wanted to share. Yeah, <clears throat> let me try to present. All right. All right, so I have a, a couple of uh, images that I'd like to share that I collected in the last couple of months. The first one is this. Can you see my screen in this moment? Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, the the whale and the hockey stick galaxies in uh, Canis Venatis, I think. Um, this was taken entirely from from home, from uh, Bortle 7. And it's uh, the total exposure is, uh, I believe, eight hours. And I was uh, pretty happy on how it turned out, because, of course, you need, this, you need the, some patience to do it, but the resolution was good. I had... Uh, a series of nights with a decent seeing so even the resolution in the in the core of the galaxy is not too bad I'm, i mean for a five inch refractor is okay i suppose and then i i started another galaxy imaging project uh, m106 let me share it so this one started from home and uh, after i collected the three and a half hours uh, we had the around the Memorial Day weekend. We had the first uh, nice weather weekend with a new moon, and I checked uh, that the Santa, the Santa Clara County parks were essentially reopening, and I went to the Coyote Dam, uh, Coyote Lake Dam uh, parking lot, and uh, I did some imaging from there. I collected three more hours, and I found another. A fellow imager there, <coughs> Tanvir, and uh, we I stayed there until 1 a.m. I collected three more hours, and it turned out that those three hours from a better sky, Bortle 4, were worth, uh, I did the math, they were worth about 20 hours from home. And so I used, uh, I, I did some uh, estimation on the signal to noise ratio of the three hours stack collected from home and the, the other three hours collected from uh, Coyote Lake found the right uh, uh, coefficient values, combined everything together, and obtained this. So I like the colors of this one. I think uh, it was, was good to have uh, those uh, three more hours from a dark site. 
and the the detail is uh, again decent for uh, for a DSLR with uh, with a five inch uh, telescope. I think. Any questions on uh, on these two images? Very pretty, beautiful. And the last thing I would like to show you is uh, I let me see if I can bring a pix in sight in focus. Yeah, so. You might remember that I imaged the M uh, NGC 20, 2903 from home, uh, I think it was three months ago. And this image was plagued by some gradients that were actually due to reflection of stray lights on uh, the, the dew shields. So I couldn't really remove them with the gradients correction. You can probably see, I don't know how, how it's rendered uh, across the web, but there are some circular artifacts in this image. Mm -hmm. And uh, I struggled to remove them, and I decided to re to try to use uh, the the technique that was shared uh, online by one of the Pixing Sight uh, team members, uh, Vicent uh, Paris. The image, the the technique is essentially is about taking an image of the same area, but with a much wider field of view. So this is an image of M uh, NGC twenty nine oh three. Of the region uh, of the the Leo sickle, taken with um, with a 50 millimeter lens instead of with a telescope. Now, you can actually ask Pix inside to take a portion of this uh, of this image and blow it up and register it to the actual uh, image here, and then you uh, you you do a a process of um, let me show you what what is the, the, the various steps. So this is the image that PixInsight has registered to the same scale as this other image here. And you can see, it's uh, you see the stars, you see the galaxies, and there's lots of noise in the background. But the interesting part is that given that the this image was taken from a much wider field of view, the gradients are very simple. So with a simple uh, multi-scale median transfer, transform to remove uh, uh, essentially, the first eight layers, I believe, uh, the first eight wavelet layers, you obtain just uh, the background, and, which is very simple as basically just the linear gradient. And then what you do is uh, to subtract uh, from, uh, you do the same uh, trick by removing the wavelet layers from the image uh, that you want to correct. So I started with this image. I remove the wavelet layers, then I remove uh, the the background that I expect, and after some smoothing, you obtain this, which is a representation of the gradients in of the artif the artifacts and the gradients in my original image. At this point, all you have to do is to use some pix pixel math to remove, uh, subtract this from this, and the result is this an image without those uh, ugly circular gradients anymore so i was really impressed at this technique and how simple it is to use it and you can even uh, you can use a uh, basic imagery that you get uh, with a much wider field lens much faster f-stop so for instance this image here is just the seven hour is just that's one hours f f 2.8 and it's one hour at f2.8 uh, is basically equivalent to, what is it, four, eight hours at uh, f11 or four hours at f5.6. So, sorry, f8. So I am very, I'm very happy with the result. So simple and so effective. Does anybody have any questions? What was the lens you used for the wide field? I, it was a, a, a Nikkor. 50 millimeter f 1.8, which I stopped down to 2.8. Okay. Uh, Same camera. Francesco, can you point to the to the article that you were mentioning? Yes. Is an article is uh, is on on the forum where it is. Let me find it. I'll, I'll share it here in the um, in, in the chat. Uh, Uh, this is it. Let me. I shared the link here. Okay. 
And by the way, Paolo, the there's a there's a beautiful uh, there's a video that uh, Vicente gave uh, to an Italian uh, audience, posted by mm -hmm. Luca Radice, <clears throat> and uh, the it's um, Vicente doesn't speak Italian, so his presentation was in English, and so for everybody who doesn't understand Italian, if you want, you can listen directly to Vicente. Uh, in English and just uh, disregard the Italian translation that comes next. I will share the, that uh, YouTube link as well if you're interested. Sure. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hmm. All right, so Bruce, back to you. Um, anybody else have any images they want to share or uh, tricks, tips, hardware, stories? Uh, okay. Well, uh, upcoming events, uh, at the moment, next month's Imaging SIG meeting is open. So uh, I'm gonna try and get a, a presenter, but um, otherwise we'll have an open session. Um, but I think we'll probably get something good going. Um, in August, um, somebody you may have heard of, Eric Coles, who is the frequent flyer on the Astro Imaging channel and one of the, one of the very best imagers out there, I think, um, is going to be presenting at our imaging SIG online. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And um, Glenn, what are your upcoming uh, events that you want to tell people about here? Um, so I haven't planned anything uh, for my program. Uh, I keep getting sucked into the uh, the armchair star party uh, deal and YouTube streaming everybody's program. So um, it's uh, improving in that uh, other people are starting to learn how to stream. So, so Wolf is doing his own streaming for solar and for the intro to the night sky and, uh, or they're just using meat and not YouTube. Um, and uh, Rashi is also learning how to stream from his from his Mac, so some of that load is is starting to shift. But uh, they still want me in the armchair star party to to uh, do the Stellarium magic and and everything. Um, so speaking of which, for those of you that that may want to volunteer, so the they have picked the next date for the armchair star party number two will be July 10th, it's a Friday. Um, and I think it's third quarter moon maybe um, from memory from the meeting last night or the night before. Um, and let's see, this might be a little bit of an eye chart, but um, uh, share. Um, th they had come up with a whole list of of targets, and I had scrubbed through it to see which ones we had images for, uh, and what Sky Tools for Imaging had to say about that target at that time of night, at least from my house with my rig. Uh, and so I had recommended uh, certain objects out of this list, uh, and we have I've listed here. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, people in the club that have already have images of those targets uh, in case that it's uh, cloudy or what have you, where we're unable to to arrange for a live shot. So that's just kind of FYI what's going on. And uh, you can reach out to me or Manoj if you want to be part of that call, and especially if you want to do some live stacking uh, from your rig on the 10th of July. That would be great. Sounds good. Uh, speaking of Minoj, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you saw uh, Mark uh, Strebeck posted the other day, uh, yesterday, I guess it was, uh, he and Minoj and uh, another uh, member got together and uh, put together a, uh, an observatory down in New Mexico. And uh, I think maybe maybe they'll present on that. So we'll see what we can find out about that. 
Uh, all right, I guess uh, everybody go out and do some imaging. It's supposed to be beautiful tonight. So have a great night. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Thank you, okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Night. Thank you.